Once again, I am glad to have you all here this morning as we have this opportunity to continue to study in God's Word. We are going to be in the book of James. Again, we have started this series this past week with the emphasis upon proving our faith. Not saying it, showing it. Living it, walking it, being it. That is our cause. You know, so many claim today, and I told you the stats uh, yesterday, not yesterday, last week, last Sunday, that the majority of people in this country would claim to have some level of faith in Jesus Christ, but you wouldn't believe it by what you see in the world today, right? Is, is that what you would think by what you see on the news, that the majority of people are Christians? And so many people will claim that I love Jesus Christ. Well, it's time to start proving it if that's the case. And here's the emphasis behind this series. No single person should ever have to ask you if you are a Christian. Nobody should ever have to ask you that question, not a single time. It should be so blatantly obvious to anyone, to every person that sees you, every person that just talks to you, because what you talk about more often than anything else is Jesus Christ. Your phone rings, they should know you're a Christian. A spammer calls you because they, you get tons of them a day. We should be telling them about Jesus. Anybody that calls, you talk to, you interact with, you see, we tell them about Jesus. You ask the question, why? Well, Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men. Why? That they may see your good works and glorify your Father that is in heaven. That they may see. You say, well, well what's the goal of all this? Why is this our emphasis now? Why is this so important to us? So that they may see and that we may glorify God. That's what it's all about by showing. The book of James is a book of application. I told you last week, James is the Proverbs of the New Testament. James shows you what a Christian looks like. The, you know what the book of James is? I want you to imagine the book of James like this. It is a mirror that you hold up in front of your face. That is your reflection to compare yourself to in your calling as a Christian. But today we're going to talk about it this way. What happens when times get tough? See, tell me if this is you. When you became a Christian, there was a brief period of time in your life where things were easy. The Christian walk seemed like it was almost easy. There was no problems. It was going well. It was fun. It was the best decision you ever made. There were no trials, no struggles, no nothing. But where were you when the trials and testing really began? See, that's when things weren't easy anymore. Instead of the easy walk as a Christian, struggles came Pain came, rejection came, strife came. And do you know what happens when that, when that comes? That's when church numbers start to drop. That's when loud voices get quiet. That's when bright shining lights get dim. You see, we have it so good here in this country that we forget that there's still persecution taking place in the, in the Lord's church all across the world. There's, there's places still in this world that churches have to meet underground because if they are found, they will be beaten, persecuted, and most likely executed. That's what will happen to them if they're found. And I, I still remember this story I came across, and it was some foreign country. I don't even remember the name of the country. I tried to find it again, and I couldn't find it. But it was about an underground church where they were meeting, and, and suddenly there was a knock on the door, and it was armed guards there with, with ARs on their shoulder. and say, listen, if you leave right now, you will not be dealt with. But if you stay, we are going to deal with you. Guess what happened? A lot of people left. And as soon as they did, the ones that remained were told this by the guards. And this is what stuck out to me. They said, we're actually here to worship God too. We only wanted to do it with true Christians. So a lot of the fake ones had left, and what was left was true, sincere Christians. They stayed. Someone once said this, a faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. A faith that can't be tested can't be trusted. So in the, the class, our, our college level class here of Christian Living 101, James starts off chapter 1 talking about the testing of your faith. The testing of your faith. So we're going to begin in James chapter 1. Now I've got on the screen beginning in verse 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 1 just so we can kind of get the emphasis of what's being said here. Uh, James chapter 1. I guess it helped if I got there myself. James chapter 1. 
Beginning in verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, for he is a double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So the idea behind the book of James is a, a faith that works. It is a faith that is put into action. And one of the ways your faith is going to be put into action from the very beginning of time is by trials and it is by testing. It is how you handle hardships and difficulties every time they come your way. Whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to face hard times. There's no way around it. You don't have enough money to buy your way out of it. You're not sly enough to escape it. It's going to happen. Listen to our announcements this morning. What did we just read about? People are going to get sick. We have a lot of them right now. We, we talked about them. There are some that aren't going to make it. People are going to lose loved ones. We, read, we talked about that again this morning. That are going through that. That are missing their loved ones. That are mourning the loss. That's what we deal with. And it's not just that. It, you're going to lose your job. That's going to happen from time to time. You may lose your house. You may lose your car. Your car may not start. You deal with rude people. You have a, a troubled employee or a co-worker that makes life miserable. Listen, folks, this is everywhere you go. This may be waiting in line at Walmart. Well, of course, for the self-checkout because you've got to do it now yourself. The sign of a true faith is not encountering problems. The sign of a true and sincere faith is how you handle those problems when they come. Do you know, do you know how much easier your life would be if you would just simply say, ah, I throw, I give up, forget it. It's, it's not worth it, I'm finished, it's too much, I just can't do it. A lot of people today do that. A lot of Christians today do that. And I should have said it this way, a lot of Christians today do that because they're the ones that would have left when the guards knocked on the door. See, James is going to give us a few things that we need to remember in our Christian walks to help us in this passage, uh, beginning there in verse 2. And I want you to listen to these as we go throughout them, the first thing he says you need to remember, and these are action statements, is first off, you need to count. You need to count. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. But now let's be real. What's wrong with this guy? What is wrong with James that he would make a statement like, could you imagine being Job and to being told, hey, Job, listen, you need to count it all joy that all of these things have just happened to you. But see, Warren Wearsby said that an outlook determines outcome and attitude determines action. Do you have any idea how much your attitude has to do with everything you face? Listen, you can't be a Christian and not go through trials in your life. It doesn't work that way. But here's the difference. As a Christian, the difficulties that you go through in your life are measured against your faithfulness to God. That's what it matters. So what do you do when you're battling that sickness like COVID? We've got over half our people out right now sick, either with COVID, contact with somebody with COVID. What do you do when you go through something like that? Or some other sickness that puts you in the hospital. We've got people going through cancer. What do you do when you deal with those difficult situations in your life and now you're told that you should count them all joy? Don't you get it, though? This is what separates you from the lost people of this world. This is why you are different. If all of your eggs are placed in the basket of this life, your hope is in the joy of this life, what happens when this life becomes filled with problems? Well, that's when the depression kicks in, the anxiety kicks in, aggression, suicide all of these things begin to, to come into play because your only hope has now failed you. This was all you had, and now it's not going your way either. But what if your eggs are placed in an eternal basket instead? Then these huge trials that deflate a lost world 
don't have that same effect on you. These troubles in light of eternity are not so bad. We lose someone close to us, and I know the days are going to be tough coming for Darren and the loss of Miss Hazel, but you lose someone close to you, and as a Christian, you, you rejoice in the fact that they've got to go home. They're in a place where they will never be suffering ever again. They'll never be struggling ever again. There's only peace and happiness and, and light all the time because of the presence of God. We rejoice in that. It's about perspective. Our hope is far beyond this place. We have joy in our soul because we have Christ in our hearts. That is the difference. You see, Paul described this in Romans chapter 5, verse 2. He said, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But then he says this, we also rejoice in our sufferings. What's wrong with these people? Why are we rejoicing in suffering? How do we do that? I mean, it doesn't even make sense. Well, he's going to give us the next thing. The second point that we need to remember, that we are to know. We are to count. We are to know, knowing that after we count it all joy, that the testing of our faith produces patience. Now, patience is not some of your favorite word, some of your guys' favorite word. I know two little boys right there that patience is definitely not their favorite word. Yeah, I said y'all. It's not what they're good at. It is not what they like. They do not do well with patience. I want things now. I go to a restaurant. I order my food. I want it before I even sit down. I order something online from Amazon. I don't, I don't even want, I'm so spoiled now. I don't even want to wait two days. I want it now. I want this whole drone thing that's supposed to be able to take it directly from there to you as soon as you hit the, the pay now button. That's our life. We want things now. But you understand that that's what makes the test in our life that much harder? The difficulties we face are that much because we want our blessings now. You think about it this way. Well, I stubbed my toe this morning. I can't go worship God now. How can I worship God after I stub my toe? That's all I'm going to be able to think about because I'm supposed to be living this good life and it's never supposed to be any problems. How could I possibly glorify God today? I went to Walmart. Somebody was rude to me. There was no way I could tell somebody about the gospel because my feelings are hurt. And now what am I supposed to do? I tell you this with all the love in the world. You better get on your knees and thank God that you are not Abraham. We'll face this little test in our life and we will fail miserably. You better thank God you are not Abraham because we know the test that Abraham went through. You hear something like Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham was tested. And he says in Genesis 22 verse 1 and 2, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. So imagine you're Abraham and you're told this promise, Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to give you a promised son and all these blessings are going to come. 25 years you wait, that son finally comes. Abraham said there, God, I see I can trust you now. You've done this. this is an incredible blessing. All right, Abraham. Take your son up on Mount Moriah and you're going to offer him to me as a sacrifice. You want me to do what? I don't understand. Do you, I don't understand why that's what you want me to do when I'm supposed to be a great nation. This is my promise. This is my blessing. I don't get it. Do you know what Abraham does? The next morning, he gets up, he takes Isaac, and he goes to Moriah. We'll refuse to worship God because we have a headache today. I stubbed my, somebody hurt my feelings. How can I worship God now? My car didn't start or, or oh my goodness, it's just so much of my life is, is just going wrong. I, I've got my friends, my family acting a fool. A faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. Not only does Abraham get moving immediately, he doesn't sit and pout for a week. He, he goes and he makes this statement of faith that is so incredibly amazing because he and Isaac are walking up on Mount Moriah and Isaac stops and he says to Abraham, his father, he said, listen, here's the wood, but where is the burnt offering? We don't have an animal. Do you know what Abraham says in verse 8? My son, God will provide for him a burnt offering. That's the faith of Abraham. You better thank God you are not Abraham. 
He wasn't playing. He was trusting. Could you imagine the crushing weight on his heart as he raised that knife up, prepared to kill his son? Then God stops him and says, now I know that you fear me. That fear is a reverent fear. Thank God you're not Abraham. These trials that we hate so much in our life, they are designed to test your faith. If you go and you're going to go buy a diamond ring, and, and you know, I, I've bought one or two from Melissa. I don't, I wish, if I had that money, I'd buy more. I don't have that much money. So, uh, you know, you go and you buy that, and what you get told is this clarity value. Do you know how they come up with this clarity value? It has to be tested. That's the only way you know the value of it is once it goes through testing. Your faith is the exact same way. Those tests that you hate so much are proving the value of your faith. See, James says that these trials produce patience. Now, what he's summarizing here in verse 3, verse 4, is basically the entire summary of, of the book of James. It is all about the Christian perfection. But I want you to notice this when he says that your faith, these tests, produce patience. This is not a passive word. Nothing about this statement is passive. And I, I love this word. That word means a courageous endurance. That's what that word literally means. You get the image of this, all right? I want you to imagine you're standing in this strong wind so much so that you're having to lean into the wind to keep from getting blown backwards. That's what's being described here. And what it's actually pushing to is you're not just standing there trying to say, okay, well, well I'm withstanding the wind. It's trying to push forward when all that's happening. That is a, a courageous endurance. It is, a pa it is an active word, not a passive word. That's what the testing of your faith produces. And so when you make that prayer that says, God, I wish you would just remove all of these trials from my life, you've missed the point of what those trials are trying to do in your life. Instead, we should pray, God, give me the strength to get through this test. Encourage me, be with me, guide me throughout this test. You know, one of my favorite stories always as a kid in youth group was the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. Did God put out the furnace? Couldn't God have just snapped his, his fingers? No more Babylon? What did he do? Those boys went into the fire, and God was with them. Could God not have just removed the lines when Jonah was thrown in there? Could God not have just calmed the sea before Jonah was thrown in? Could God not have done all of these things? Did I say Jonah? Daniel. I have to hear about that now. Could God not just remove the lions with Daniel in the den? Jonah in the seas where I was going with that. God did not remove the test. God strengthened and encouraged them in the test. Which leads to the next thing that James says we need to be doing as Christians. Let. We need to surrender to the will of God. We need to let God. See, trials produce patience, and we need to let patience have its perfect work in us. Folks, you've got to stop resisting God. You have no idea how much we do that in our lives today, that we resist God. He is the fabric weaver of this entire world, and you don't think we can trust Him to handle the situations in our lives? One of the hardest things you will ever learn to do as a Christian is submit to His will. And I told you that last week, that that's what baptism is all about. It's not about special water. It's about your submission to Him that in that water you contact the blood of Christ. That's why you are to be baptized. You are submitting yourself to Him. That's what it's all about. But instead, we'll make this statement, God, I don't know why I'm having to go through this. God, I don't know why I'm struggling here. Do you know why you struggle more often than not? You're trying to go through a door that God closed. You're trying to open a door He closed or close a door he opened. James said these trials are perfecting your faith. That's what's taking place here. What does James mean here by perfection? What does he mean when he says be perfect? A lot of translations will use the term maturity instead. Your translation 
uh, may say either maturity or perfect. It just depends on what you have. But James, uh, not James, Matthew 5, verse 48, Jesus Christ said, be perfect as God is perfect. Why would Jesus give us something that we can't be? Can you be perfect as Jesus is perfect? As God is perfect? No. You'll never be as perfect as God. But guess what your, your point that you're angled, angled towards should be God's perfection. That's what we're striving for, pushing for. We are to be like the Lord and follow His example. That's what it's all about. But now here's the unfortunate aspect for you to remember. There are no shortcuts to Christian maturity. I wish there were. There are no shortcuts to that. That only comes with your faith being tried and tested. That's when the maturation process takes place. But you know what else comes when that happens? This is all about application, right? When you become a mature, faithful Christian, you have everything you need to help somebody else. It is faith in action. If you want to be used by God, God will use you. If you want to help others, God will use you to help. Those opportunities will come. Listen, I had no idea how blind I was to this for so many years. And now they come just by walking to Dollar General. Or, or walking in Dollar General. I'm not there. I wish I, I don't have that ambition to walk to Dollar General. But they come by being there. They, they come every opportunity you get when your faith is tested and it produces this patience and this perfect work that is in you that you are now complete. These opportunities will come. But now here's where we put our crutch out as Christians, okay? You will say, and I, I'm saying you will say because I have said this, I don't think I can do that. We'll say, well, you need to go talk to somebody about, I just don't know that I can do that. I, I don't know that I know enough about the Bible. I just don't know that I'm there yet. When will you ever be there? See, that's an excuse. I, I've, I, I, I'm not picking on you. I have been there. Well, I lived there for a long time. And I didn't limit it just to, I didn't know enough about the Bible. I had an excuse for every day of the week. And I had people that I loved that I knew were lost in this world. And I did not a single thing to help them. But I had an excuse for every day of the week. God will use you if you submit to him. Stop trying to open closed doors and close open doors. Be faithful where you are. If you will be faithful where you are, God will do the rest. The final thing this morning that we're going to look at, and we could, we could sit here for hours, but I'm, I'm trying to keep it a little shorter this morning. James says the final thing that we need to do is ask. You need to have a prayerful heart. Verse 5, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. There's nothing more important than praying to God when you go through these trials in your life. We're told that we can boldly enter the throne room of God, yet we'll sit on the outside and say, well, I don't know why I'm going through all these situations in my life. You have the avenue to lay every concern you have in your life before God. Do you know what you need most in your life right now in these times of trials and testing? You need wisdom. We talked about that's why we started. With, that's why we started in James 3 last week. You need wisdom. Because we are the ones, Christians are the worst about this, that will start saying, why God? Why would you put me in this city? Why would this happen to my family? Why would this happen to my friends? Why, does this, why is there evil? Why is there hurt? Why, is, why, why, why? Christians are the worst to ask that question. What we should be asking is, God, what do you want me to learn from this? What opportunity are you placing in front of me that I will, I will take because I have faith in you your faith cannot be perfected and you be ignorant at the same time. We have to have wisdom. Wisdom only comes from the Word of God. See, this wisdom is much higher than what's outside these walls. It's the divine truth. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Do you understand the aspect of that statement that made? You hear that all the time. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. You even find the acronym ASK that people use all the time. All these things. Do you understand these are action statements? These are things you have to do. These aren't passive. We just, you just sit back and say, well, all this is going to happen. And no, you go after these things. You have to get going, get doing, and get to showing. Stop saying, well, I have faith. Show it. But you know when the best time you can show your faith? The most ground you will ever gain with a single person in showing your faith is showing it during times of trials and testing. That is the best you will ever show anyone. And so what James is saying here in a summary statement is rejoice when you face trials and when you, face te- when you go through these testing because a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. That's what this is all about. And listen, we could, like I said, we could talk about this for a, a lot longer time, but I want to leave you with this this morning. Your current condition is only your conclusion if you let it be. Your current condition is only your conclusion if you let it be. That means you don't have to give up every time there is a problem in your life. In fact, I want to encourage you to do this today. I want to encourage every crew. We have a bunch watching with us online this morning. I want to encourage you with this. Stop giving up every time you hit a speed bump in your life. That's what Satan wants you to do. What does James say these trials are doing? They are perfecting your faith. Let them have their works in your heart. So my last question for you then this morning is where do you turn in these times of trials? Where do you turn when things do get bad and when there's struggle and there's hurt and there's pain and there's difficulties? Where do you turn? Do you trust in yourself? I mean this with all the love possible in the world. If your trust is in yourself, you will fail. You're not strong enough. None of us are. That's why the world is what it is right now, because we're not strong enough. Or will you trust in God? That's where faith is made perfect. You know, we've got this, this, well, it's really been taken out of context, say that, well, God will never give me more than I can handle. Do you know how wrong of a statement that is? Because what we've done is taken it out of context. Say, well, well, God will never give me more than I can handle. No, God will never give you more than you can handle with Him. He will give you more than you can handle on your own. But not more than you can handle when you put it on Him instead. That's what that's about. So my final question this morning is, where will you turn in times of trials, in times of suffering? I pray that you make that decision if you haven't given your life to Christ this morning. I pray that you would do so. Uh, If you're here this morning and you're in need, we're about to have this invitation song. I would encourage you, if we can help you in any way this morning, to respond to that invitation as you have need. If you're online with us this morning and you have uh, needs as well, please reach out to me. We at the church here would love to help you however we can. Whatever you're in need of this morning, I want to encourage you to come now as we stand and sing number 696.